Hello. Just checking we're all tuned in. Great to see so many people with us tonight. Um, loads of nice messages in the chat already. I'm just checking my microphone. Yeah. Great. So, um, wow. People from all over tonight. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to Assembly Online. Um, if you haven't joined us before, my name is Henry. I work as the Visual Arts Coordinator for the Assembly House Trust. In April last year, we launched Assembly Online, which is a free program of visual arts, sound, poetry, and performance uh, that happens every two weeks on YouTube, tonight being one of the events. Um, I'll be back at the end for a bit more chat. Um, but tonight is an exhibition preview and discussion for Groundwork Gallery's new exhibition, J Japan Water. And we're very lucky to be joined by the curators of the show, plus all the artists who will be joining for a, a discuss discussion later on. Um, and I hope that you enjoy it. And if you have any comments or questions, do post them in the chat and I'll forward them on to everyone. Um, just saying hello to a few people tuned in from New York City, South London, Norwich, Kings Lynn, Outpost Studios, from Norwich, from Wolverswick, from Winston, from Kings Lynn, Iverness, um, Halston, Edinburgh. France, Woodbastic, Someone's Kitchen, and Budapest. Wow, okay. Um, that's always nice to see because people, um, the people on the event tonight will only see, um, only see numbers. And so it's really nice if you let them know that you're there in the chat. Um, and someone from Paris, great. Okay, I'm now going to go and pass over to um, Veronica, um, who a lot of you will know. And um, I'm going to stay with my camera on throughout the event tonight uh, to help host it. Um, just going to unpin myself. Oh. Why is Nano? Um, yeah. Am I on now? Yeah, yeah. Okay, shall I start? Yeah, no, do, do. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, hello, everybody. Um, it's so, well, I can't see you. I'm, and I'm sitting in um, Groundwork Gallery in splendid isolation at an occasion which would normally be thronging with people. So this feels um, quite an extraordinary kind of event. So what, what, what I'm going to do um, is walk you through the show. I thought about doing a video, but um, with my shonky phone got walking around, it was kind of the wobbly, um, amateurish looking thing. I'm not sure that my presentation is going to be very much more professional, but I hope you will get a sense of what the exhibition is like. Um, what my designer has already said, he thinks it's the best exhibition I've had. Um, for me, all the exhibitions are wonderful and it's like one's children you know they're all equally wonderful um so um but it is incredibly exciting to be starting this new show i'm going to share my screen um so you can see images of it um so there'll be a little cup here here we are So Japan Water, and you're going to meet some of the artists later um, when I finished introducing it. Um, so that is the graphic um, by Pierce Marchbank. Now this exhibition is, um, it's, it's, it's veers between art and life. I mean, it came as a whole a show about water, but it became as we worked on it together with the artists, 
we realized that there were some very strong underlying water themes, which um, re really did speak about the Japanese concern with water. And of course, everyone will know this image, Hokusai's great wave um, of, of Kanagawa, a woodblock print um, from the early 19th century, which is the, the most incredibly famous kind of tsunami wave with, um, with boats riding it. Um, and looking on the internet absolutely everywhere and realize what an absolutely iconic image it is. So you see it here on sweatshirts and on ties and on prints and posters and murals and um, um, shop, shop products and all sorts of things. It's, it's just ubiquitous. Uh, and it is, as you will see and hear from the artists, it's an image that recurs and recurs and recurs as, as an important one um, uh, for a lot of artists interested in Japan or a lot of Japanese artists. The other great water story that we know about, a very, very tragic and sad and dramatic one, was the great tsunami of, of 2011 and the nuclear disaster of Fukushima. Um, and here we have and the earthquake that started it. So we, here we have a wall of water um, and there's a map of Japan showing where Fukushima is. But the bottom right picture, there's an, a new, this was like last year, a new tsunami is expected at any time because there are always going to be earthquakes. So it is a very tense and fragile situation. The cleanup um, from the, um, from Fukushima still. Um, and here we see people raking over and that there's still contaminated land. And I mean, this is something I think that um, might crop up later on in one in Hakan's talk and, and his work. The other great water story in Japan is it is 70% mountainous and forested and many, many dramatic waterfalls. And here are just a few of them. Um, and that again, that the rushing purity of water features in the art, but is also very much a feature of the country. The other big feature is paddy fields. These are particularly um, spectacular one example of terraced paddy fields by the water, um, but rice growing in, in wet, wet ground. Um, and again, that's something that is picked up on in the art of the exhibition. And here, this, these pictures were given to me by um, one of the artists, Isal Mura, who you're going to hear talking later. And this is, these are his family. This is his family farm um, in Northern Japan and his family picking or planting rice, um, or harvesting rice in the paddy fields in the 1950s, wonderful pictures. So um, that's really thinking about what the great stories are that underlie, underpin many of the works of art that we're going to see. Um, and so here we are, this is the exhibition, um, the, the, the sign outside um, and the sign in the window and the, um, the catalogue leaflet. Again, this is all Pierce Marchbank graphics. And um, here we have, in fact, the work behind me by Isao Mura, uh, which he will talk about. But um, on, on the right there, you see his work about paddy fields. Um, he's an abstract artist. Well, at least he's, he's a figure, he calls himself a figurative artist, but his work is often abstract and very measured um, and very restrained, um, but uses um, elements of the landscape and his background and his, um, his origins in the farming landscape of Japan. And here is, is my friend Catherine, who was by my side throughout the whole installation, absolutely invaluable help, um, a kind of perfect person to help one with you know, absolute perfectionist. So here we are spirit leveling. Um, we did a lot of that. Um, so these are, these are Isao's works. And then on the right, uh, a huge great wave painting by Jonathan Mooley, um, who you will hear speaking later on. So that Jonathan is, um, Isao is, is Japanese. Jonathan is not Japanese. Jo Jonathan is English, but 
very much in, um, influenced by Hokusai and the Great Wave and, and had done this very dramatic series of wave and water pictures um, some years ago um, and has continued with that theme and it's very much a key part of the exhibition. So now we're looking, these, I'm, I'm looking at these opposite. In fact, I'm, my computer is resting on the table that you see in the front there um, with Jonathan's um, water, um, drawings uh, and scroll paintings of, of waves. And there you see Isao and Jonathan's paintings ahead. So um, always as part of the exhibitions is we've still got Richard Long's great ooze Great Ooze River drawing 2016 on the wall there. And yet again, somebody said the other day, um, oh, I thought it was the builder spilling his coffee, but actually it's River Ooze mud thrown at the wall and shows the waters. It is about water in effect, and it is about soil. Um, and it fits absolutely beautifully with this exhibition. And through to the back, you see Hakan Topal's work um, Hakan, um, I'll, I think there's another detail of that coming up. Oh, first of all, I just wanted you to see um, the wonderful parallel between um, the Richard Long and the Nanashiomi pair of waterfalls. Um, these are dramatic, huge um, woodcut, woodcut prints. Um, and it, they, they look fantastic next to the, in the same sight line as the Richard Long. Um, there you see on the on there also next to them are some works by Lisa Keiko Curtin. Um, these are also they're very watery, but they're a different scale from the others. They're very delicate, very intuitive. She uses a mixture of materials, um, soil and coffee grounds and sort of organic materials. Um, and there you can you can almost see the flow of water as she's she's made them. Um, Oh, and this is Hakan Topal, who he was in residence um, in Japan and, well, and made work around the Fukushima disaster. Um, and he will, he will, I won't preempt what he's going to say, but just to say there, there's a pair of videos, which <laughs> this is a preview and it is work in progress. And at the moment they're upside down and not yet fixed properly to the wall, um, but they will be tidied up and shown the right way up by the time the exhibition opens properly in two weeks time. But there on the right, you see this uh, whole sequence of, of kind of an installation um, that represents a, actually a very, a very elements of this very fragile landscape that was left behind. So this is now moving up the stairs. Uh, Nana Shiomi, four wood woodblock prints um, of, of water of gods um, after Hokusai, and they're, they're shown as, as, as water, wa sort of water, kind of fragments of waterfalls. And again, they, they follow the whole theme of the Richard Long so well, um, but in, in a different medium. And they take us up the stairs. And here we are on the landing. Um, this is Mr. Groundwork Jack, um, putting up a pair of prints by Nana Um, So these are, um, what are they called? The Room on the Other Shore, um, Lightning and the Room on the Other Shore, Moon. The one on the left is, is Moon. And there's the, the old spirit level being used again. Um, and there they are both side by side. Um, it's quite a perilous job putting those up in the stairwell um, because you have to balance the um, ladder on, on the stairs. But I thought you might be interested in seeing some of this process we go through to install the work. And then um, this is the work that Nana is going to talk about, which is um, shown next to the, that pair you've just seen. Um, and that's the 7th of May, 1956 and the 8th of May, 1956. And she'll explain why it has that title later on. And then on the right, you see um, more of Lisa's work, um, these lovely, small, um, very delicate, um, muted colored um, mi multimedia, mixed media works um, that are very kind of watery. Um, and there, there's Mr. Brown White Jack again, putting up 
um, three, a, a, a triptych of Nana Shiomi is right at the top of the building. Um, it's a very dramatic spot and this, it's impossible to photograph because you, you, you can't get rid of the staircase, but they do look dramatic and wonderful. Um, so you, you'll just all have to come and visit this, visit the show. So this is in the first floor room, um, some more of Nana Shiomi's work. Um, there's four um, tea bowls that, are, that represent the seasons and then the mirror pond um, on the, on the, uh, of, the, of the Kyoto temple reflected. And you, I mean, that, that is par excellence, the pure water image. Um, you can't tell which is which, which is the real building and which is the, which is the reflection. And that was more, I mean, it made me think very much particularly about the clarity of that image and how we really don't have that tradition very much in this country of crystal clarity and crystal purity of water. Our iconic water images, our, our, we, our water is murky and dirty and muddy. Um, so that there, was, there seemed to be something to be said about the parallels and the relationships that we could think about and that this work might make us think about in terms of our attitudes to water over here and also how we venerate it or don't or need to venerate it a bit more. Only yesterday there was a lot of news about, uh, there was news about sewage effluent in, you know, from water companies allowing sewage. Um, that we have a lot of dirty water to deal with. So, um, Isao Mura was um, a bronze fellow at Chelsea College of Art, and there's some um, bronze, bronze haiku, um, which is about water. And then, uh, oh, and this, um, these, these are these wonderful water pots um, made by a, a young designer, Shizuka Tatsuno from Tokyo. And these are bizenware, which is one of the five great pottery traditions of Japan. And they're unglazed and then they're, they're beautiful because they're modernist, but in this ancient traditional um, technique. Um, and water is supposed to taste sweeter um, when it's kept in these, when it's kept in these pots. There they are, and they have lids that fit for satis with satisfying perfection. Um, and then the other remaining work upstairs is Jonathan Mooley's watercolors um, and the big circular painting, which I think he's going to be talking about. Um, and there's Catherine again. Um, these were quite tricky to hang, Jonathan. Um, so we're feeling quite pleased with ourselves having done this. Um, partly because they're all slightly different at the back. <laughs> we don't need to go into that, but um, it was quite a technical accomplishment. Thank you, Catherine. And um, so that's my tour of the show. This, we, we, we feature on the Japan, Japan UK season of culture, which was devised for the Olympics, continues, um, and whether or not the Olympics are going to go ahead um, in whatever form, I don't know, but there we are on the right. Um, and there's even a little um, Hokusai wave down there. I don't know whose, whose um, event that is, I cut it off, but um, you can see it, it appears again everywhere. And we've got a number of events coming up. The first one is on the, well, the exhibition opens on the 14th of April. On the 15th, we're delighted and honored to be part of the um, Sainsbury Institute third Thursday lecture series. Um, Isao and Chris are going to be talking, uh, and, and Christina Gut is going to be talking as well. Um, and it's, it's called The Art of Rice, um, and it will be picking up on the whole um, background of, of growing, uh, growing rice and the, and the fireflies and the insects. Um, we've we've learned a lot about that, what, what's happening in Japan at the moment um, to rice farming and the effect of pesticides um, and the effect on insects. So there's a lot, a lot, a lot to talk about. We've got events coming up, which will be looking at the environmental consequences, the environmental impact, um, thinking about 
the purity of water but, and the power of water from those, um, the, the context I talked about at the beginning, but also pollution, the other side of it, um, and how we need to think about water and what this, um, what's, we're always trying to do at Groundwork Gallery is to, is to move from looking at the art to thinking through to its environmental impact and what we can all do and what we can think about more deeply as a result. And I think these artists are all opening up very distinctive ways for us to see water in quite new and interesting ways. So I'm, I'm going to hand over now to, um, to Ida Norahama, who's also been working with me um, as a wonderful um, helper in all sorts of ways. She's, and she's interviewed all the artists, um, so she got to know them all well. Um, and so she is going to be introducing them and they're each going to say something. So I think I've, I've finished my, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. So I make the way for, um, Ida. Hello everyone, um, I'm Ida Norhammer, as Veronica said, thank you for the introduction. I'm her intern, so I've been helping out with a bit of everything, and it is a privilege to be working at the only sustainable art gallery in the UK. Um, so let's move on, and I'm going to go ahead and share the presentation. So, oops, sorry. We're going to start off with Lisa Keiko Curtin. Um, so she currently lives in London with her husband um, and grew up in Japan. So as Veronica stated, um, her and her family worked in rice paddies. Um, she then moved to Houston where she studied at the Glasgow School of Art. Um, she tends to work with mixed mediums and since moving to London, she's, I guess, had to downsize a bit to things like pine needles, coffee, bread. Um, she also enjoys uh, creating and sort of arranging participatory art. Um, and today she will read a passage she's written herself. And while she's doing that, I will be showing two of her works. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce and welcome Lisa. So I, I, I did unmute, right? Mm hmm hear you. Video. Oh, the video, start my video. Okay, sorry. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Anna, Ida. Um, konbanwa. I am going to read um, my uh, statement. I grew up in a farming community in Japan, so I know how important water is for sustaining life. My great grandfather was strongly involved in purchasing a reservoir for the village farmers in order to stop the fighting with other village farmers, which continued day and night during the rice planting season. This importance of water gave me the idea for my Miz series, Miz Meaning Water, which I started over 10 years ago. As the conclusion of my first participatory exhibition of Miz in the UK, I sent the participant artwork by sea mail to Japan so that the work was in touch with the surface of the earth and most importantly, the ocean. We have unfortunately forgotten that life and we humans originated in our oceans. We go to the beach on holidays, 
but never think about that life came from there. I have tried to express my feeling toward our ocean in this work, the title, we call our fruit. Uh, this is a riding of the current. So, um, yes. I feel the ocean is like our mother, but sadly, we are critically dumping waste and plastic items into it, which thus threatens our future life. I have used salt in this series as it represents the ocean and our body. We know we have salt in our body, such as blood, tears, and other body fluid. It is said that our body fluids contains 0.9% salt, in fact. Uh, this second piece I would like to talk about is the title Riding the Cross Your Current. The Cross Your Current begins in the Philippines, then flows in a northeastern direction past Taiwan and Japan as part of the North Pacific Ocean Current. This current brings warm water and feeds the coral reefs, reefs of Japan and is vital for the fishing industry. However, global warming is affecting the crucial current and may damage the fish population and hence the life of many. Arigatou gozaimashita. Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, now, moving on, I would like to introduce Jonathan Muelli. Um, he began his career in art history, which he studied at Cambridge. Um, and I guess he soon realized that he preferred to create art rather than analyzing it. So shortly after that, he moved up to Glasgow where he currently lives and has his studio. So at the Groundwork Gallery, which Veronica already introduced, he will be exhibiting a series of wave paintings. So I'd now like to welcome Jonathan. Thank you very much, Ida and Nora. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Great, that's great. Um, well, welcome to all my friends whom I know and uh, a welcome too to all the friends whom I don't yet know. Uh, it's very strange talking out into the void, but it's delightful that there are so many people out there uh, listening and looking. And I'm, I'm sure we all agree that it wouldn't it be nice to be there as well. It looks a, it looks a very interesting show and I'm very honored to be part of it. Um, Ida, could we have the first slide? Thank you very much. So I'm going to start talking about uh, the biggest painting. Um, this one on the left is, uh, is an oil painting. Uh, it's all in oil on canvas. Um, it's just over six foot square. And actually that in itself is quite significant. I'm, I'm just about six foot myself. And there's something very important about scale in painting, uh, as all of you who are artists know. Um, and it's wonderful uh, occasionally to indulge yourself in painting on a scale that is uh, somewhere close to the scale of your own body or just slightly larger than that, because it means that when you, uh, when you paint, when you uh, create these uh, expression, expressive forms, uh, you're using all your muscles. You're using your arms, your back, your legs, your wrists, not just your fingers and your wrists. So this is a, in a tradition of expressive painting. Um, and it's part of a series that actually started off uh, consciously uh, in, in a different place altogether from, from, from the way of paintings. Uh, it started off in a series of abstract paintings about uh, more fundamental energies, uh, it seemed to me, than, than, uh, uh, than just water. So, but having started this series, which was quite geometric to start with, we'll look at one of the round paintings later on, there were also quite a lot of square paintings. Um, in about 2016, the square and the, and the circle began to break up and uh, become free floating and the forms became 
less rigidly geometric. Um, and I found that I'd, uh, in this series of wave paintings, that I'd produced something with great flowing blue and white patterns that I realized couldn't be anything other than water. They had to be water. So it was idle to pretend that water was nothing to do with them. So the first painting started from an abstract route, uh, but became the great wave after, in a sense, after it was finished. Then subsequently, I began to meditate on that great wave theme. Uh, and I looked again at the Hokusai painting, which you'll see in the top right of this slide. And I realized that my great wave paintings really were extraordinarily uh, close in a way to the Hokusai, although completely subconsciously so, so that you had the great movement of water through them, but you also had the tossing of these canoe-like elements that you'll see in the big oil painting on the left, uh, that was a completely unconscious uh, product, if you like. So that's one of the key paintings that is in Kings Lynn. I'm delighted that it's there. The other two paintings in the series actually are also in East Anglia. Uh, um, they're both in Cambridge. So there's a sort of East Anglian Fenland triangle, um, uh, which I hope doesn't all go uh, badly for for the future tsunamis over the over the over the fens, but anyway, that's that's by the by. Um, then on the, on the right of this slide, you'll see roughly to scale the two large watercolors, one of which is exhibited and one of which is 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 available to see at Kingsland, but not actually on show. Uh, and this is when I dis was working. Uh, still working on this wave theme. You can see they pick up the same composition of the, of the oil painting on the left, but they use watercolor as their medium, which is an obvious thing to do. If you're painting the wave, you think to yourself, well, I'll also paint in the medium of the wave. In other words, I'll paint using water. So they have a very simple composition. They're done very quickly. Uh, the water flows across the top of the painting and then diagonally down through the painting and the broken up fragmented orange and black lines are the lines of the things that are floated or destroyed or uh, swept away by the great wave itself. Could we have the next slide, please? Now, um, after Veronica had asked me to, to participate in the exhibition, I decided I, I would do some paintings that were specifically for it. And so, Knowing that my work was uh, partly inspired by Hokusai, but also partly informed by the terrible images that we'd all seen of the great tsunami in 2011, and of course of the tsunami in 2004 in Indonesia as well, uh, I thought I wanted to engage with that a little bit as well. So this is one of the watercolor paintings I did for the show. And it's, uh, although it's a self-contained work, it's part of a series of four paintings which trace the wave so that you, I don't know if you remember seeing the shots of the, the, the terrible shots of the, of, the, of the wave surging in land and sweeping away houses and greenhouses and cars. It was a terrible sight. So this painting is, is, is if you like, looking at the wave from above perhaps, or from inside the wave, as it tracks across the landscape, uh, tossing things aside, sweeping things away, and picking up dirt. Because of course, the original image that Hokusai gave us, and that we've reproduced so many times of the great clear blue wall of water, we now know is not true. Because as soon as the tidal wave hits, it becomes filthy with human products. It becomes black. It becomes full of earth. It becomes dangerous. And so these paintings are trying, just using simple traditional media to reflect that. So if we could move on to the next slide. This shows the sequence of the images starting at the top and going down. And you can see how I conceived the series so that it was one river, one wave tracking inland, moving from one section to the next. So it starts at the top left and then moves to the right and then moves down and then in the next painting, it follows on and follows on all the way, zigzagging down across the paint, the, the, across the paper, uh, and across the landscape. Uh, the two paintings that are exhibited in Kings Lynn are the two at the bottom. 
So that describes those. If we could move on to the next, thank you. These are slightly earlier. They came after the oils and they were the beginning of this exploration of the idea of doing a, a wave or a, a river. Um, these were the four scroll paintings that I did, of which the top two are exhibited in Kings Lynn or partly exhibited because they don't unroll fully. And obviously I was also partly influenced by the idea of Japanese scroll painting, although these are not done uh, in, in such a technically, technically sophisticated and beautiful way as the Japanese scrolls, which are paper laid up on silk. Uh, these are on big thick watercolor sheets, which are much more intractable and don't unroll so easily. But they're my, my sort of interpretation. I'm used to working on paper and in watercolor. So these are my interpretation. They're big, they're 10 foot long and uh, a foot high. So I put in the two photographs on the right hand side to try and give some idea of the scale of them if you, if you imagine them laid out on the studio floor. The two top ones I did uh, in sections um, because that seemed to be the easiest way. That, and then I moved on to the two below, uh, which were all done in one great movement from left to right or a series of movements from left to right. So each of the brush strokes takes a fully loaded watercolor brush all the way 10 feet from the left hand side to the right hand side. And I see what happens to that watercolor stroke as it encounters various obstacles on the way, just as I imagined the river flowing or the wave coming in over the landscape. Those are those paintings. Could we move on to the next slide? Uh, this painting on the left is, is uh, also done specifically for the show, or should I say it's, it's also reworked for the show. Um, I did a version earlier on, which some years ago, which wasn't completely satisfactory. So uh, when this show came up, I thought, I think I can take this painting, which again, because of its blueness and the, because of the energy and the, and the analogy to waves uh, that had entered this painting, I thought this is about water. So I reworked it slightly and remounted it and reframed it. And having done that, I realized that the energies of it were rather similar to the other, but less famous Hokusai paintings of waves, which are on the right, uh, which he did late in life, I think. I may be corrected by somebody who knows better than I. One, I think the one on the top is a masculine wave and the one at the bottom is a feminine wave. And perhaps somebody will comment and tell me why that is. I, I, I don't know. Uh, but those to me obviously had parallels with the work that I'd done on the left, which is about uh, energy, but it's also about the contemplation of energy and the idea that you can confine your meditation upon uh, something profoundly energetic. So it's a more meditative piece. So could we move on? I think that may be the last. Oh no, finally, yes. These are uh, a few little things which I'd almost forgotten about. They came in last uh, to the exhibition and they're also on show unframed in the same glass case as the scrolls. And these are another little meditation about water, but in a different way altogether. These, as anybody who's familiar with Hokusai's famous uh, series of 36 views of Mount Fuji, are all uh, copies of those, uh, of those images. So you'll see the great wave on the left and various other famous images, uh, some of them very abstracted. The one on the top center is the famous gust of wind painting. So the way I did these was to take pieces of paper, which were deliberately of a different proportion from the Hokusai prints, so that uh, I was uh, obliged in a way to shake up the composition in a new way. Uh, and then I would look at one of the images that Hokusai did and, uh, for some while and then paint, uh, draw these. They're all in coloured crayon, just simple, small drawings uh, done during lockdown. Uh, and they're done from memory. And they're sort of postcards from Hokusai to me and from me back to Hokusai. And they're a sort of uh, a combination of memory and observation and fantasy. And they're a sort of, uh, I think the postcard analogy is good because I'm now, especially because of lockdown, but also because of the current uh, climate crisis, 
very conscious living in Scotland, but maybe I'll never visit Japan. Maybe I'll decide rightly that I shouldn't use all that uh, that fossil fuel simply for my own self-indulgent pleasure to go to a country that I've always wanted to visit. Maybe I never will visit it. So the, the oceans will still separate us uh, and I will be imagining Japan. So lockdown, this strange state that we're in is a sort of fragile uh, nursery for the imagination. So it's enabled me to go back to using my imagination in a way that I used to when I was a child, to fantasize about places that I can't reach, that I can't, and things that I can't do. So these are just thrown in at the end. Uh, four of them are in the show, two of them aren't. So the, I think the, the top row, the images are all in the show and the bottom left, the other two I've just used on the slide to fill in the space. So that's all I have to say about those paintings and many thanks for everybody's attention and I look forward to hearing from the other artists. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, moving on is Isao Mira. He, like Lisa, grew up in Japan, specifically northern Japan, where his family also worked in the rice fields, with, which Veronica has already mentioned. Um, Isao works with a lot of natural materials. For example, some of the images you can see in the background of him there um, are used, or use reeds that he's grown himself in his garden. Um, he's an abstract artist um, and he uses a lot of different materials like bronze um, and oil paintings in very ingenuitive ways. So with that, I would like to introduce and welcome Isao. Thank you, Ida. And also thank you to Veronica and Jonathan for arranging the show. Domo arigato gozaimasu. I'm a painter and a sculptor from Akita in North Japan. My family has a rice farm for more than 300 years. When I was young, I worked in rice paddy. In the planting season, late May and early June, there was a special school holiday, so all local children could help one of the busiest time of the rice paddy. We carried seedling from nursery to paddy by hand cut quickly, otherwise seedling will dry out. That's very important work. In last summer, in latest summer, we ran lots of bells to scare sparrows because sparrow nibbles young rice. Our fertilizer was manokwe, mixture of horse manure and urine and live straw. Finally, we prayed to Tanokami-sama for good weather because Rice is very sensitive plant. Those days, we saw many, many firefly in summer and red dragonfly in autumn. But nowadays, rice paddy environment has changed a lot because use chemical fertilizer, pesticides, and fungicides and also acid rain. They contaminate water and the soil. They kill many creatures which live around the paddy. They damage the ecosystem. My new series of painting is called Rice Paddy. I want to express ideal season and environment. I want to express my memory and feeling about the landscape of my childhood. I want to express my deep desire to rebalance, 
to a more natural way of agriculture. So I decided rice grass in my garden. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I decided to grow rice grass in my garden in London. When it was ready, I cut, I cut it, tied the bunches, and air dried. Then I used stalks, seeds, ears in my work. I want to bring rice paddy into my paintings. So they are abstract paintings, but they have real texture and the visual aspect of rice. Uh, could you show us my uh, image, please? Yeah, thank you. This painting called Nursery. This painting is based on Japanese character, Ta, meaning the rice paddy. A square box divided into squares. This is ideal pattern of rice field. It's also the chessboard pattern inside each field. This best pattern for planting all seedling have enough room to grow. Next, please. Deep snow. This is called uh, deep snow brings nitrogen to the rice paddy. Snow contains nitrogen from the air. So when snow melts, nitrogen comes into the soil. It gives energy to plants so they can grow strong. Gold leaf and deep green color symbolize healthy plants and niches. Next, please. Warm rain. Warm rain water is very important for rice to grow. Warm rain was very important for rice to grow. As the stalks get ripe, they become heavy. It bend towards the ground like gentle rain. So I use stalks to represent gentle rain. Next, please. This painting called Great Harvest. For me, the nice stalks and green color represent Minotta Inaho. It's full grown rice. Gold leaf is heat and happiness. Great harvest needs big money, village rice festival, plenty of food. Next, please. Thank you. This painting called Kumo and Kaze. Background is earth and sky. Rice needs water and good ventilation to grow without disease and insect damage. The effect of clouds and wind go deep into roots. They do not stop at surface. I drew Kumo and Kaze in melted wax because Kumo and Kaze, cloud and wind, are powerful and fluid form. They take on the shape, say, sorry, shape of the clouds on the environment. They write important message on the landscape. Thank you for listening. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much to Isao for that wonderful presentation. Moving on, um, I would now like to introduce Nana Shiomi, who um, you may already know works with woodblock printing. And like 
Jonathan and many other artists she is heavily inspired by uh, Hokusai. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Nana Shiomi. Thanks, Ida. Can you hear me? Hello? Okay, great. Um, hello, everybody. This is Nana Xiaomi. I'm doing woodcut print. Um, uh, the, could you show my picture, please? Thank you. Um, this is a work I have done in 2005 called 7th of May, 1956. 8th of May 1956. This is a vertical arranged diptych printed from the same blocks in the same, exactly the same way. So 8th of May is my birthday and then 7th is one day before. The dates means the world with me and then without me. The repeating motion of the waves rising and falling day after day within that eternal repetition. One day we are born, another day we are gone. In the flow of time, since ancient time, I'm appearing to the world just between the day of birth and the day of death. I will talk about how I got this idea. Um, can you imagine my life as a printmaker? I'm repeating the same things every day. Wake up in the morning, work, eat, sleep, work, eat, sleep again and again, especially when I'm doing the editioning of my print. My daily life reminds me the ocean and the waves coming and going and coming and going. So I think we learn only from our daily lives. So I found the repetition of my life and the repetition of the waves at the same time as a printmaker. If you are the fisherman, you can learn everything from the ocean. You set out to the sea in the morning. The weather is very changeable whether you will catch lots of fish or not. That will be depends partly on your experience, part of your luck. So this must, you must feel joy when your catch is good. You thank to the nature and the God. You reflect on your errors. Then you look forward to tomorrow. You can learn from each day. I believe that you feel something similar to me, something universal. You will discover some truth from your daily life. That's why I'm, I make prints because I feel there is a great truth waiting to be discovered. This was the story behind this work. Um, this work is a vertically arranged diptych printed from the same blocks in exactly the same way. However, if you look at carefully, you will find the differences between these pictures. Prints are not the unique art forms. It has editions, but they are all originals. I want you to love these differences and originalities. Someday when I have gone, this work should be four pictures get together with the actual date of my death and one after. The date means the word with me and without me. Four pictures will be a simple record of my existence in this world. But at the same time, this is a celebration of my life as well. So um, if somebody wants to purchase this work, I'm offering the purchaser's private dates 
his or her date of birth and one day before. As the title of this work, for the celebration of their lives. Thank you for listening. Thanks. Sorry, thank you very much. <laughs> um, moving on, we have our oops, fifth and final artist, uh, which is Hakanto Paul. He is currently staying in his home country, which is Turkey. However, he usually lives in New York. Um, where he works as a professor. So Hakan has a academic history in civil engineering as well as women's and gender and women's studies, um, additionally sociology. He's also founded the Exurban Collective, which focuses on art with a purpose specifically in response to catastrophes. So I'd now like to um, welcome Hakan. Thank you very much, Ida, and thank you very much, Veronica, and the Groundwork Gallery team, and Henry hosting us tonight. As you know, during the last two decades, there has been many large-scale catastrophes hit mostly coastlines in Turkey, United States, Haiti, Southwest, Southeast Asia, and Japan, of course, and it had long-term consequences. So the impact of these natural disasters intensifies, especially in um, urban areas and coastal zones. And these uh, disasters, in fact, exposes our vulnerabilities of, um, of the built environment. And of course, at the same time, the contemporary social and economic uh, inequalities, as well as the neoliberal development. So um, the Uniform Cut, the project that I am presenting at the Groundwork Gallery, is a part of my ongoing research about catastrophe and international waters. And it was an outcome of my um, of uh, two residencies that I participated in 2015 at 3331 Arts Chioda in Tokyo, and as well as uh, Tokyo Arts and Space Residency in 2017. So as part of this research, these residencies, I traveled to Miyagi Prefecture, and uh, I went to uh, different cities, and I stayed in hotels which were transformed into worker uh, dormitories, and I stayed there and I tried to examine the devastating earthquake and the tsunami and impact on the coastal communities. So the idea was to, with, it, with this project, I did a lot of videos and photographs. I wanted to contemplate um, on the idea of nature when it intersects uh, with the built environment and po perhaps rethinking possible and better futures. So usually, I'm from Turkey, as Ida mentioned, and in 1999, there was a big earthquake in Adapazare near Istanbul. And after the earthquake, the catastrophe was exploited by the neoliberal Islamist government. And in fact, these governments in, in New Orleans, in Haiti, anywhere in the world, exploits the very idea of collapse. So my question was, when I was traveling and contemplating within the, these coastal communities, what is the, what is the idea? Uh, how can we reverse um, the damages during the aftermaths? I think the video stopped. Is the video working? Video should be, yeah. We can go to the next slides, it's not, not a problem. And so the idea of recovery, the, the pictures, and then the, as you see, the, the first image that you saw, it was an, the only standing building in the, in the city, and it became like a temple. So uh, as soon as a catastrophe hits, we really try to uh, recover, and the healing process starts. And the idea of reversibility of the damages 
that I want to really uh, ex excavate. So in, in these pictures, these are conceptual photographs, I call them, because they are details of the buildings that was left behind after the tsunami. So I kind of like with the macro lens, I try to take uh, bits and pieces of the buildings left as if I was an archaeologist, a contemporary archaeologist. And then they are, when you are looking them closely, they look like maps. They look like coastal areas. We can go to the next image. And then you look at like some of the like uh, buildings, and then you see that in the cracks of these concrete, the nature reemerges. Next. And then yes. And then these are the, some of the pictures that, and also there's the formal qualities that I was drawn to. And then next image, please. And then these two images actually are from Istanbul. Be just before I went to um, Japan, I was traveling, I was walking along the waterfront, and then these people were looking towards Japan in a way, and in Marmara Sea, and Marmara Sea holds this major fault line in Turkey, Marmara fault line. So in a way that the devastation, the expectation that a kind of a major earthquake will bring to Istanbul, it's gonna come from the sea, similar that it happened in Japan. So in a way that these kind of disasters connects the humanity that I was very interested. Like this kind of vulnerabilities makes us together to understand and to react uh, the consequences. And then the next slides, please. And then this is, the, this is an exhibition slide that was exhibited in Japan. And uh, as, you, as you see from Veronica's pictures, it's, it was a different installation in a way that we readapted the work to the groundwork gallery space. And it's composed of um, two channel video installation that I show some of the uh, sections from it. So I guess that will be it. I'll try to cut it short. Maybe we can have some questions and then we can discuss. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hakan. Um, that is it for all of our artists and speakers. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And I think I'll be handing it back to Veronica. Uh, thank you. I just want to say thank you to everybody. What I was almost in tears at moments. It was such a moving experience listening to you um, all talking about your work and giving us real insights. Um, I learned a great deal because I haven't, no, I mean, I, I thought I knew your work having been living with it for a while, um, but actually every time you speak, you reveal new thoughts. And I also particularly want to thank you because I know how nervous you were. Um, we had to spend quite a lot of time persuading some of you to contribute and you, uh, it was all so, so, so brilliant. So thank you very, very much. Um, I mean, I've, I've got a lot of questions. Um, we will be having further events when we can talk freely um, when we have the audience with us. Um, because I think there are many common threads that we could, we, could, we could talk about, about, I mean, I love the idea of nature breaking out um, into, the, into the environment, um, that nature regaining ground that had, has been devastated by catastrophe. Um, and, and the, the idea of um, Lisa's ideas that we came from the ocean um, and Nana talking about her, the world with, with her and the world without her. There's so many profound things and Isal's background with farming and, the, um, and thinking about the health of the land and how his paintings encapsulate the health um, that, that he would he would like to see um, in the farming landscape. 
So there are just so many profound thoughts that are bubbling up. Um, I don't know, Henry, have you been monitoring, have people been asking questions? Yeah, no. So it's then that my voice was coming to you, but it wasn't going to the YouTube channel. Um, but yes, uh, uh, some people are uh, talking, no one's asking questions yet, but would you like me to put everyone back on the call? Because um, at the moment it's just you. Um, yes. Yeah, um, I give everyone wants to rejoin. Um, and if everyone wants... Oh. I'd also like to thank Ida for doing such a great job in introducing. Um, yeah, you were a very good, calm compare. Um, great. I agree. Um, I think everyone should be. Yeah. So I think there was a question um, for Lisa. Yeah, and I, I received one not in the um, not in the chat, um, which was because Lisa spoke about the participatory exhibition um, when work was sent by sea mail to Japan. Um, what did you ask of the participants? Oh yes, um, I provided uh, like a, a piece of paper the size of a postcard, and then um, when the visitor came to the gallery, I asked them to draw or paint about the, their image of water. Uh, so um, I don't know. So, some people wrote um, the poem as well. Um, then I thought uh, to come to think about this now, that was um, quite abstract questions um, I asked on the spot, but they um, they really uh, they took a time. You know, even a small postcard. They took quite a lot of time. Then um, everybody did just express themselves very well. So I was uh, very, very happy. The important thing is a postcard, and that's go by sea mail to Japan. So that was uh, my purpose. And then I did a uh, related, water related exhibition in Japan. So all just UK and the, Cross the ocean, Japan together, and the community together. So that's what I did. And um, and also th um, for those joining from Japan, it, I I believe it's um, an unfortunate timing, um, isn't it? Like five in the morning or something there. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so very well done for presenting so well, um, and 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 being up early. Um, just something earlier from the chat. I mean, there's there's loads of uh, messages at the start from people saying that they were um, tuned in to um, to watch. Uh, something Paul Levy said, that, which I thought was um, very good, was uh, when you were talking about the um, the mirrored uh, the building mirrored on water, um, the uh, and how different that is from the water in the in the UK was. Um, the 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 water our water images tend to be in motion that people in the uk tend to paint these kind of water as this big splashing thing rather than anything still or as a general but um i think it's quite good um, yeah i have to say though that um nana's picture of that um water temple in in kyoto actually is very reminiscent of the custom house in Kings Lynn, which is just outside the building here. And one day I took a photograph of that, of the custom house mirrored in the water. <laughs> it looked so similar to that. So that contradicts actually what I said, um, because, you know, we can get that effect, but it's just, um, just very striking. And, none, and a lot of your works, you know, the, the leaping carp and the thinking carp, uh, at the bottom and the, and the top of the, of the waterfall that's just over there. Um, 
which uh, we, we, we just don't think about water creatures in that way that, you know, the thinker and the leaper. Um, it's such a magical thought. And there's, there seems that there's a lot of magic in, in a lot of the work um, and a lot of spiritualism and the, the idea of the world with, with you and without you and the waves representing your, the, the, the rhythm of your life um, and the, the pattern of your life. It's quite a magical thought. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's also, um, sorry, it's also very nice to, um, this kind of idea of, of, of uh, water and movement coming back, that's come back through quite a lot of the Assembly Online events since last year even. Um, and it's, it's nice um, when you notice those uh, those themes that dip in and out. Um, uh, was it, was it, I think Pedro from the Great Yarmouth poet um, spoke about the sea as Her Majesty um, that, that stuck with me. It's, um, it's nice when, yeah, it's nice noticing the correlation. Um, Tessa Grundon has said thank you all so much. Uh, beautiful, thought-provoking work. I look forward to visiting the gallery someday soon. Um, and Adam King, a, a great intro. I look forward to seeing the show. Well done to all the, uh, well done to all the groundwork. Um, I think it's great that so many people, especially people who aren't able to travel very far at the moment, um, were able to see the show. And it's really, it's really great that you um, uh, did, did, a, did a preview. And nice to see you in, in the gallery too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it does, yeah, it does feel weird though. I feel, um, I feel sort of, I'm privileged to be surrounded by all this beautiful work. Um, but it, yeah, it does, and as I say, normally this would be thronging with people, you know, with mm. quite good openings and people love to come. Um, it's usually very convivial. So I hope by the time we're allowed to open things up in June, there will be an event. We will have a big party um, and people will be able to come. And the, the show's open from the 14th, isn't it? Yes, 14th of April till the yeah. 31st of July, Wednesdays to Saturdays, 11 till 4. Hmm. And if people really can't make those times, there's always an option to make an appointment at other times. Always happy to show people around. Um, Ivor Rowland's also saying thank you, Veronica, for bringing this to King's Lynn. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Bernie. Yeah, and well done for yeah, and getting it through with uh, posting and arrivals and everything. It's yeah, a achievement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was quite a, quite a feat. Her Helen Wells is saying thank you to all the artists, sensitive presentations, and great talks from Frederick. Um, a question for. So, um, has this rice plant attracted the same insects and nature in the UK to those he remembers from his childhood? That's from Rachel Ann. Oh, Isal, yes. Are you? Oh, sorry. Isal, are you there? Can you repeat, Henry. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, a question um, is: Has it has his rice plants? Um, have your have your rice plants um, attracted the same insects and nature in the UK? To those that you remember from your childhood i don't know because i'm living in london then uh i can't see many insects but only here in my garden i can mm. only peel but the butterfly and the hobo fly and i never see and but uh drum fly here but maybe going to common maybe we can see but i don't know yeah I don't maybe. know. Also, when I was a child, the really sort of a crowd of the uh, dragonfly and water, really, really, it's amazing. Also, uh, locusts as well. But also, it, it maybe you supplied. We um, had a correct locusts. We cooked the eat. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's quite uh, crunchy, but quite yes. Long time ago, but not nowadays, but yeah, firefly also, and we we really many sort of uh, children. So early summer, after the dinner, we just go uh, collecting what uh, firefly. 
I went with my uh, young brother, then uh, collecting the big large jar, then put it in about 20 or something, then bring to at home. Then we put on the uh, desk and then we can't, but, but it's the famous song, sort of about uh, firefly and uh, study in the firefly and snow light, snow reflection. But the snow reflection, very uh, full moon in the winter, maybe you can see it on the other window, but actually impossible. But they sort of symbolize to your hard work, want study. So that they use a tiny hint of light to reading a book. That's just, sort of, I think, uh, present to uh, students. So that idea was originally from an ancient China. So scholar studies, uh, not much money, therefore he cannot buy what a lamp, but so can write or any any light before he study with what uh, firefly lights and snow reflection lights. But I think yes, yeah, that's fireflies here. I know. I never but do you, well, other thing, I, I want to question, um, in a lot of England, his lots of a small canal, but, uh, water, sort of a pond, and we have a, a, a common, and the country has a lot of a, sort of a uh, small river, then with uh, no sort of a, uh, built bank, sort of a, uh, in Japan nowadays, you use a lot of what uh, built about concrete sort of edge because water running quicker uh, go to uh, sea. Then therefore, but lots of creature as well like living in the edge of the uh, river, they just not have the chance to leave space. That's also quite. Uh, damage the so, uh, ecosystem, I believe. But is my I talking about the other sort of really extreme sort of attitude. But I think nature is uh, we have to think more seriously. That's I felt uh, firefly also insect. They they're gone. They will be we the future really bad. But especially what everybody now talking about. Uh, honeybee. Honeybee is, you see, they was insect pollination and pollinate about uh, apple trees, the cherries, everything. That's a really key uh, insect. They can't work, just also very, very big disaster. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that very sadly we share. Yeah. is the devastation to insects that my the last exhibition at groundwork was about bugs about insects yes. and um, one of the artists cornelia hess honiger was tracing the effects of nuclear radiation on bugs and had done so ever since chernobyl but since the chernobyl damaged insects the worst she found were in fukushima the most shocking um, and because of the persistent radiation, but she found it even from normal nuclear power stations. Persistent radiation is damaging, mutating and causing mutations in bugs. Um, and we've we've got to know through through what working on this exhibition, we've got to know a journalist in, in who's working in Japan, British Canadian called Phil Carter, who's written two articles in The Ecologist. And I think Chris and Isawa are going to talk about this at our um, Art of Rice event um, in a couple of weeks time for CISJAC, the Japanese center in Norwich. Um, but his work is quite remarkable, um, what he's revealed that the effects on devastation of insects through neonicotinoids and other pesticides used in rice paddy fields. Um, so yeah, there are big things to talk about, about the damage we're inflicting. But it, I mean, what's also so interesting is Hakan, your story about um, the repair we're trying, or the, 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 the repair of 
So do you feel your work is about nature's repair or our repair? Because I'm listening to um, you know, machinery and all sorts of things from your video I can hear, um, and diggers and things repairing mechanically. But are you equally interested in nature's repair or is it nature breaking out? What, how, what is the role of nature that you feel? Right. I think it's hard to consider nature as a kind of a unity, right? It's very diverse and it happens unpredictably, which is beautiful. But what happens with the human actions, for in the case of Japan, these walls that they are building on the coastlines, right? What does it mean in terms of recovery, in terms of reversibility of the damage because we are making we are creating more damage to the coastline the nature than the tsunami itself in a certain way and this happened in turkey too so this there is this devastating thing happened and then the government used this as an opportunity to expand its construction spree in a way right so of course i'm really considering the nature as a, as a starting point because I want to see this because nature happens, right? It constantly moves. Co coastal lines are never static, right? We, it's always moving in and out and things are happening. And how do we build on the coastline is a good question, right? Do we need to really tame the nature? Or do we need to move out a little bit so that we can retreat, right? I think the, my question was a little bit, when uh, uh, the, this kind of devastation happens, we have to be really be humble. And sometimes to be able to say that we are defeated and then we should be retreating to the higher grounds as they did like 300, 400 years ago, right? I mean, coastal areas were never occupied. In Turkey too, look at the villages. And right now I'm living in coastal region in Turkey, in Bodrum, and then there's a 600 years old village, and which was the only village in this town, which is in the mountains. Nobody lived in the coastal areas. And that was the precise reason. Of course, there were like wars, etc. but the, the sea always brought some form of devastation. And then the relationship with the sea was always respectful in a way. And then now we lost that, and then we are trying to tame it, and it is, we are not succeeding in taming nature. No, nor will we ever. We will never, never succeed in taming nature. I mean, we have, to, we have to think culturally about how we respond. As you say, move away or change our way of life. Mm -hmm. But that, that's a much bigger, bigger question. question. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. But I think we're going to pick the, some of these ideas up at our events, especially the second one in June. We're going to be talking about power and both both um, political power and as well as water's power um, and the consequences of that. How we deal with that? Could I just? I feel, oh, sorry. I think no. With um, Jonathan's picture behind me, <laughs> I feel as though there's this turbulent image engulfing me. Um, <laughs> sucking me in. Um, yes. So, Henry, I wonder if um, are we? Um, is it um, time we, we should I, say farewell, or are we? Uh, yeah. Um, I'll just say a couple more things from the the chat on YouTube. Um, just uh, uh, Cleo saying congratulations to you all on what looked like a great show, and thank you for your time and talks this evening. Uh, John Mitchell was saying lovely presentations. Uh, thank you so much. Um, in uh, um image, uh, boats are major elements. Uh, boats are major elements living with threatened by serving over the wave. Surfing over the wave. Is there a role for boats in the art of Japan water? Oh, interesting. Um, would anybody like to answer that? Oh, <laughs> not mean. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm probably the wrong person to answer that, but that's a very interesting question because it hasn't occurred to me is the 
obviously that is i think i don't think we have included that have we veronica really so, no. um, you know the a different type of mastery but it's not a mastery you know the old-fashioned idea of a boat that was uh almost organically uh wedded to the environment that it lives upon like a natural a natural creature almost like a, like a living creature uh that's a different idea about uh engagement with the with the sea or with with the river uh yes we should have really in in, in a thought of that and brought that in more but you'd need a boat maker you should have you should have asked a, a, a boat maker to take part as well but yes what a good question i i don't i yeah. don't hmm. i think boats are here in spirit <laughs> <laughs> um, if anyone's if anyone's watching this from a boat please let us know in the chat yes uh, <laughs> <laughs> um yeah uh, Roy Brooks also just saying a fine spring treat. So looking forward to experiencing these lovely poetic works soon. Bravo all. And uh, Marion Catlin as well saying very fascinating hearing from the artists. Hope that this will be available to share and review later. Yeah, the, um, the event will stay up on this YouTube link, assuming that's fine for everyone involved. Um, and yeah, so please do pass it on to people and let them know about the show opening. Just another comment from uh, Jackie Jones saying there are some fascinating contrasts between the purity and pollution of water. Um, yeah, as, as, as we've discussed tonight. Um, so yeah, if no one's got any other questions, then maybe we should round up there if, um, if, you're, if you're happy to. Yes, um, I think we've, we've done it. We've done it justice, at least <laughs> at the beginning. <laughs> there's, there's way, way more to come. Yeah. Um, both through online events and through just coming here, if you can. And let me know. I mean, I was t I was advised pre um, all the COVID thing. I was advised by some marketing people not to put too much online because it will stop people coming. But I guess the world has changed. So let me know if you think there should be more put online, and we'll just put more images online. But I just don't want to. Do you just need to know that the impact of seeing it and seeing the textures and the richness of color and everything um, is just so much better in real life. You need, you need to see it in real life if you can. We'll do everything we can to make it safe um, and stop people crashing into each other on the stairs and you know all that sort of thing. Um, it'd be lovely to see you all. I Great. think that's, that's, all, that's all for me. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you um, all so much. Um, if you all um, do stay on the call, I'll just do a quick roundup um, on here. But thank you really for, for joining us from all, from all over. It's been um, a real international events that um, are just not possible in real life private views sometimes. No. Um, and so like that's been the, 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 the huge thing I've realized over the last year of doing these events is just being able to uh, just, yeah, being able to bring people into the same room even if only virtual, to hear people talk about their work is really is really valuable. It is wonderful, really um, wonderful. Nell just saying Hi. thank you. Oh, um, hello, Nell. <laughs> um, and Frederick saying, having seen the works, I cannot stress the importance of seeing it in person. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just a, a small note from me, um, although we had uh, two events in two weeks here uh, due to one being changed. Next, um, The next event is in two weeks as normal. Uh, Sarah Lowndes will be doing her What Community Means Now talk, which I think is important to a lot of people. Um, and then two weeks after that will be the programme closing event, um, which the details will be announced quite soon for that. Um, also, the details for the summer show will be going out soon. Um, as I mentioned on last week's event, we were very pleased to have over 900 submissions for that and selected 40 works to show for the show in June. Also very much looking forward to doing a show in the house. Um, if you are new to Assembly Online and would like to stay in touch and hear about future events, I've posted the link to the chat and I'm also just posting the link to Groundwork Gallery in the chat as well so do have a look on the website there for um, their upcoming events once they're open but um, 
thank you all for tuning in um, and take care and see you at a real event soon. Good night.